Liz and I am a PPF fellow and I'm uh, very excited to have you all here joining us today. I will be facilitating our session today and I also have the pleasure to be joined by um, Shelby Lamar who is the um, assistant director of PFF and we're really excited to have the session uh, for you all. I hope it's uh, really useful as far as um, kind of talking about some next steps on developing a teaching portfolio and um, Shelby I don't know if you wanted to introduce yourself or any other uh, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Shelby Lamar. As Liz said, I'm the Assistant Director of the Preparing Future Faculty Program, and I'm just offering some technical support for Liz today. Uh, so if you do need anything, feel free to direct chat me. Great. Thank you, Shelby. Great. So before we get started, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. Um, feel free to keep your uh, cameras on or you can also turn them off, whatever um, you feel more comfortable. Um, feel free to keep them on if you would like. Um, as far as our session today, we do plan on making it engaging for you all and allow opportunities to kind of hear what you have, uh, what, what you have experienced as far as teaching, uh, teaching portfolio, but we do ask that you can please keep your mics uh, muted during the session unless I note otherwise. And if you have questions that come up during the session, uh, feel free to send them in the chat and we'll try our best to answer them. We also will have a uh, time in the end of the session to answer any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them along the way, or you can also kind of hold them to, to the end. We'll have about 15 minutes to discuss questions. And another item here is we also have a, um, a, uh, a worksheet that we'll be working on. So I'm gonna send it in the chat box now and feel free to download it so that we can, oops, um, so that we can just have it ready. So I'm gonna send it in the chat box. So oh, actually, no, we don't have it in the chat box. We have it as a link. Let me, well, Shelby, would you mind sending it as a link? Let me see if I could just. Perfect. Thank you, Shelby. So if you want to op um, open that document and just save it on your desktop, uh, it is a, a cloud based document. So if you can save it on your desktop, we'll be uh, working on that document later during the session. And, and then also at the end of the session, we will have a uh, survey that will be um, uh, conducting uh, just to kind of get your experience on the session and get some feedback from you all. So uh, keep a lookout for that um, survey as well at the very end. And with that, we will get started. Uh, so let's get started on the first slide here. All right, so I wanted to just first start and, and feel free to unmute your mic uh, for this piece here. I wanted to first uh, just start with the very kind of big picture on what do we use portfolios for. So think about um, you know any and kind of within your own discipline, within your own profession, how have portfolios been used? Um, you can think outside of teaching. So does anyone want to share kind of what what are some ways that portfolios are used and kind of in, in different professions? Anyone wants to send that in the chat or share it out loud? Yes, great, great start. Yes, definitely artists can use portfolios. And actually, um, as far as using portfolios, I think there's a lot of commonalities as far as how a teaching portfolio can also resemble an art, uh, artistic portfolio, because we do use um, a lot of self-reflection and annotation as part of that work. And really, we want to make sure it resonates to who we are as educators. So that's a great one. Does anyone have any other ideas of how portfolios can be used? None yet? All right. So <clears throat> the other item that we have here is, does anyone have, is anyone currently working on a teaching portfolio or, or have any experience with a teaching portfolio and, and have any idea of how it's, um, how it's currently used? Would anyone like to share? You can send it in the chat or you can also mute your mic. Great. 
great. So it sounds like we have a couple people who are very new to teaching portfolios. So it's a good session to get started with. Um, and we, that's exactly what we will be talking about. If you've never heard of a teaching portfolio, I'll share some, some tips as far as how, how they're used and what they look like. Any other, any other thoughts on how a teaching portfolio can be used? Nope, all right, so we'll get started. I think the, the piece here that we'll start with, and I wanted to start with a, a clip from um, uh, one of my favorite kind of iconic movies as a, as a child, which is Mary Poppins. And I wanted to use this as kind of a, a way for us to explore the value of using a teaching portfolio and also as an opportunity to kind of ease our minds during this, uh, what might be a very stressful time for us today and kind of during this time. So if you all wanna just, um, Watch this clip with me for a couple minutes. What I wanted to share with you all, which I thought was really um, a really kind of fun way to think of a teaching portfolio. And, and although I think it might be silly in some ways, uh, the scene that was shared in, in the Mary Poppins movie, and I don't know if, if you all have, have seen this before, but what I really, what I thought was really fun about this scene um, and is a great metaphor for um, a teaching portfolio is that she uses this magic bag, which is a way to illustrate um, you know, the purpose of a teaching portfolio as a teacher and an educator. And in this scene, uh, Mary Poppins begins to pull out all kinds of crazy um, items that you would not expect to fit in a bag. And, you know, to the amazement of these children, you know, they thought it was it was a very kind of magical experience for them. And what, what I liked about this as far as using it as a teaching portfolio metaphor is that, you know, in a lot of different ways as educators, we, um, we, act like Mary Poppins and, and have this amazing way to be resourceful and innovative and um, forward thinking as far as how we uh, teach and how we educate students. And the children in the scene might um, instead be students in your classroom, they might be a hiring committee, or they might be an audience that you really want to reach. And as part of, of having a teaching portfolio, it really becomes your own magic bag of having the necessary items and tools and information that uh, will ensure you to be uh, successful as an educator as well as successful for your students. So it's a, a really great way to think about it. Um, and what's what's great about having a magic bag is it really kind of depends on how you want to use it and what specifically you want to use it for. So um, think about that as, as you kind of think about your own way of creating your own magic mag ma magic bag, just like Mary Poppins. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll take another stab at that clip later on, but just for time's sake, we'll, um, we'll continue on. And yeah, uh, Adrian, uh, you don't remember the scene? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a scene that, um, it's no, a pretty um, nice Yeah, I, I actually was saying I, I do remember that. Oh, scene. you do remember it. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember like every detail, <laughs> but it, I know it was kind of, you know, magical, like I said, magical and mesmerizing. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, exactly. It, it's a really nice, um, it's a nice scene and it really kind of resonates, you know, as far as how we kind of make our own magic, magic as educators, right? So um, yeah, so we'll go, we'll try to go back to that one. But for now, let's, let's so let's start with uh, the main items as far as what we want to kind of get out of this meeting. And as far as creating a teaching portfolio, it, it can be a really daunting and tedious process for many of us. So I hope this session helps simplify some of that process for you. And overall, the goal for the session is for it to be engaging and to spark some ideas um, and for you to walk away with some next steps that best fit you and your own goals as, as an educator, um, as a teacher, as, as however you want to really kind of help, um, help people learn um, in different settings. And some of the key elements that I, I would like to uh, share with all of you is um, number one, you know, let's talk about what a teaching portfolio is. Um, it seems like many of you might be, um, might be new to the process and might just have some kind of initial questions on what is it and, you know, why do we need it? So that's kind of the first element I want to uh, talk about is, you know, what are the key elements that make up an effective teaching portfolio? Um, why is it helpful to assemble one? Um, how does it kind of, how can it be used during job seeking opportunities? And then also uh, talk about the components that make up a teaching portfolio. <clears throat> and then I wanted to conclude with talking about some, some quick tips to keep in mind as you start planning your teaching portfolio. So um, they're pretty high, high level. So I think it'll apply to all of you, no matter what stage you're at, if you're either 
you know, just starting to think about using a teaching portfolio um, as part of your development um, in education, or also, uh, you know, if you're already having a teaching portfolio, what are some ways that you could improve it? And then to conclude, I wanted to, uh, or I will be kind of talking about some resources that we offer at PFF, as well as um, other resources um, in the public domain and in other universities. So does anyone have any questions or any comments before we continue? We're all good? All right, so let's continue with the first um, kind of key area that we, we we want to kind of go through, which is, you know, what specifically is a teaching portfolio and how are, um, how is it used? And some of the most um, important ways, and, and keep in mind, there are other uh, reasons why um, or what a teaching portfolio is used for, but some of the, the key reasons um, as to why we should be using teaching portfolios is a great process for uh, selecting, organizing, and curating teaching tools and information. It's also uh, a great way to develop your own representation of who you are as an educator. And this is done by organizing and cur curating your own teaching tools and information. Uh, it can also be a great way to collect uh, your teaching accomplishments. And um, you, know, you can do this as, as you move along in your, um, in your career and um, can kind of create your own collection of, of what, what you've accomplished as an educator. And we'll talk about what accomplishments mean in a, in a bit, but those are some of the key um, areas that, um, that, we, that we wanna consider when it comes to um, what a teaching portfolio is. And then lastly, and, and one of the most important pieces is that it's a great opportunity to reflect and improve your teaching. So by, um, by uh, collecting and, and organizing your information, by summarizing some of your teaching accomplishments and by uh, looking back and, and seeing how you've evolved as, as an educator and also what have been some of the successes as far as the courses that you've taught, um, some of the successes that, that your students have had it's a great way to reflect back and, and um, improve the way you teach. So um, those are some, some high level reasons as to what a teaching portfolio is and, and, and why it's important. Uh, and the other element is there are different types of portfolios and there are different uh, terms that are used. So a course portfolio can be, um, uh, is mainly used for kind of specific courses that you may have um, developed and you, know, you have syllabi and course materials and sample assignments. So usually you'll have a portfolio of course information that you'll kind of keep and, and um, use for other courses potentially or, or adapt um, as you progress in, in, in your teaching. Another one is uh, a professional portfolio, which is typically, uh, you know, like, it, it, like the word says, more of a professional uh, a portfolio that you use kind of to demonstrate your scholarly work this can include your research progress, your teaching experience, um, and other accomplishments that you've acquired over time. And, and then lastly, a teaching portfolio is, is sort of a combination of the first two. So it's, uh, you, you do typically have course information, as well as some of the professional aspects of um, how you identify as an educator. Um, the, the piece that's really important for a teaching portfolio is that it really describes and documents a lot of different aspects of your teaching ability. And uh, it's typically in two different formats. So you have a summative portfolio, which is usually created for the purpose of applying to an academic job or promotion or tenure uh, position within a department. So it's usually kind of like a, a, a fine-tuned kind of finalized portfolio that, um, that you can share um, in a professional setting. Versus a formative portfolio is typically more uh, created for the purpose of your own professional and personal development. It could still have elements of a summative portfolio, but usually the, the, the main distinction is that it's still forming. You're still kind of curating and adding new information and, and using it more kind of as, as an overall portfolio for your own kind of um, progress as, as a teacher. And at some point in your career, you might find that you will keep both a summative as well as a formative portfolio um, because they have different purposes. And also uh, a summative and a formative portfolio, they, they may share a lot of the same um, components. 
Uh, we'll focus more uh, today on, on the formative teaching portfolio and kind of how to shape it, a formative teaching portfolio. But I did want to make that distinction because you, you may kind of um, come across different terms that are used for, for portfolios, so it could get confusing sometimes for that reason. And I wanted to pause and just see, does anyone have any questions or any thoughts um, as of now as we continue? Take a look at the chat. I think we're all okay? Okay, sounds good. So let's continue. So the next element we wanna talk about is why assemble a teaching portfolio? And we had a question from Holly actually. So Holly, your question is, do people often ask for one type of portfolio in an interview? Uh, it really depends. And I would say um, not all, um, all uh, em employers or kind of who you're interviewing for will ask for a portfolio. And we'll kind of talk about that a little further along in the presentation. Um, typically, they're probably looking more for a summative portfolio that has um, your information more uh, refined and kind of are looking for very specific elements. Um, but it might be that a formative portfolio might be appropriate as well, depending on, on what specifically they're looking for. Hope that answers your question. All right, so any, any other questions before we continue? Okay, so as far as assembling a teaching portfolio, some of the main reasons why it's, it's it's really helpful to have one is it you know like we said it's a great way to reflect and refine our teaching skills methods and philosophy um you will also find as as you kind of move in your kind of ac academic career the more you're able to track uh the, the the easier it is to kind of also understand your development over time and um another another really nice uh way to use a teaching portfolio is to make it public and to have it be used as a public representation of who you are as a teacher and scholar. Um, I'll share some, at the very end of the session, I'll share some um, digital teaching portfolios that I thought were really nice um, as kind of aspirations for um, what a teaching portfolio can eventually evolve to look like if, um, if you wanna create kind of a digital presence. And the other piece that's, that's nice is it's also a great way to record and document your teaching effectiveness um, especially when you're applying to different types of faculty positions and uh, potentially looking at a tenure position later on, uh, the more you're able to kind of record and track your information, um, the easier it will be to uh, present that to um, your committee uh, later on. So that is uh, some of the reasons why, and, and I wanted to focus on job seeking because I'm sure many of, many of us have that in mind, you know, as far as uh, creating a teaching portfolio and the fact that it does take some time to create one, what, uh, what, what specifically is a benefit um, as far as job seeking and how does it help us with job seeking? And one of the main uh, reasons why it's useful and, um, and I, I did wanna make the disclaimer that not all um, faculty positions will require a teaching portfolio. It really depends on the position itself, but you do get some kind of indirect benefits from creating a portfolio and the fact that it helps you develop a meaningful uh, teaching philosophy statement um, by looking at kind of all the work that you've done and some of the key achievements that um, that have resulted by thinking about, you know, you, who you are as an educator, what specifically has shaped you as an educator, um, what are some of the most meaningful things that have come out of that? And that really helps evolve a really meaningful uh, teaching philosophy statement. And we'll talk about kind of some of the connections between your teaching philosophy statement and your um, portfolio in, in, in a couple uh, slides later. But that is one of the really great ways uh, to use a teaching portfolio. Another great uh, reason for it is because it helps you adapt to teaching um, and be able to develop new methods and materials. You know, so the, the better you're able to kind of look at your information and, um, and either uh, adapt it or update it, uh, the, the more you can be adaptable to, to different types of teaching styles. And, and then as far as job seeking, another really key way to use the teaching portfolio is it really helps you be effective in job interviews, both in terms of preparation, as well as uh, during the job interview, you can actually refer back and speak to specific elements in your teaching portfolio. So those are some reasons. And then also some more concrete ways that you could use a teaching portfolio if it's not directly requested by the committee is um, depending on the, the position that you're applying for, 
there might be an opportunity for you to add it as an appendix um, in your curriculum vitae if they allow that. It could also be a one page document that you could have links um, or a table of contents that has different portfolio contexts that you want to, um, you know, highlight to them and, and connect them directly in, in your process. Uh, depending on the, the, um, the, the, the group that you're interviewing with, you may also be able to bring a printed copy of your uh, portfolio so that you can reference as you know, you're asked questions. And it could also become an additional item um, in your application materials. So some applications will allow you to add supplementary documents and that sort of thing. So it could become an additional item that you could use um, in your application. So those are some of, the, some of the key reasons as to how it could benefit you in terms of job seeking. And as far as the components, the American Association of Higher Education, uh, their thoughts on kind of a teaching portfolio is that it should have three kind of core elements. It should be structured um, in the sense that it should be organized, complete, have some sort of creative element depending on kind of your own um, teaching discipline and, and teaching style. Uh, so some questions you could ask yourself is, you know, is my is my portfolio neat? Um, does it have the contents organized in a fashion that makes sense? Um, is it representative of the purpose that I want to use it for? As far as it being representative, um, in addition to kind of having that structure, you should think about is it comprehensive enough to really demonstrate the scope of work that I could provide um, and the courses that I've taught over time. Um, so some questions you might think about is, you know, does my portfolio portray the different levels of courses that I want to teach? Um, does it display the interdisciplinary nature of, of the work that I do, the cross-section work that I do? Um, so these are all kind of good questions to ask yourself as you're trying to figure out whether um, your portfolio is representative of kind of what you can offer. And lastly, the, the third element, which is um, big emphasis is uh, being selective. So you, we have a natural tendency to want to collect everything and show everything. But what's really important about a teaching portfolio is that you wanna make sure um, you have it uh, refined and curated so that it has a, the components that are really what's gonna attract the reviewer. And you wanna keep in mind your ultimate purpose of what you're using that portfolio for. And for selective, what's uh, a really great way to see it is for a formative portfolio is you know you you can have a more robust collection of information but as you're creating kind of a summative portfolio you do want to refine that further and really look at what um, what elements are most important to highlight and that are being asked or expected from your reviewer that you um, that you might be working with we have another question what types of documents do you put in a portfolio uh, Mitch, that's a really good question, and we're actually going to go through all the different elements, and that worksheet that we're going to work on will kind of walk you through what uh, documents you should have in your portfolio. Great question. All right, perfect. So any other questions before we kind of go through that, uh, go through the different components? All right, so we will continue on. So uh, Mitch, this is exactly what we're going to kind of focus on for your next question. So you primed me perfectly. Um, these are the different components that go into a teaching portfolio. Keep in mind, um, the, the list that I have here are the most common kind of um, components that are included in a teaching portfolio. This doesn't mean that some of the information that you may have is not appropriate, or um, we also might have items that another committee might not might um, want to see. So this is most general, but there might be some kind of deviation depending on what specific portfolio you're creating and what you'll be using it for. But some of the most common pieces that, that you want to consider as far as components of a teaching portfolio is you want to have um, a teaching philosophy statement that is um, pretty complete. Uh, you know, obviously a teaching philosophy statement will continue to develop over time and it's never, uh, it's an iterative document that you'll continue to, to refine as, as you move along in, in your career, but you should have a, a pretty finished uh, teaching philosophy statement. Uh, you should also have a diversity statement. Uh, any type of reflections on your teaching, the, the reflection piece is really important because it really helps 
um, helps you reflect on how you've used your um, your teaching philosophy, your different te te teaching uh, your teaching approaches, and as an ability for you to kind of be reflexive of how you um, how you approached uh, teaching. Any documentation that you could provide on um, on your teaching. Uh, on your teaching uh, during your time as an educator. So if you have actual course information or um, specific elements of the ways that you have taught students is also really helpful. And then also any information that you could provide on your teaching effectiveness. And we'll go through these in detail, um, but these are kind of some high level uh, components. And then the second, the second piece you wanna consider are materials that demonstrate student learning. Um, so this can include, you know, any um, assessments that you've done, also exam scores or any, uh, any documents that really show how students have performed in your classes and how you've been able to support them in their learning. Uh, another really important one is any strategies that you use to ensure that your teaching is inclusive and ethical. Um, what types of uh, theories, frameworks um, you use, and, and any uh, practices that you follow to ensure that your classrooms are inclusive and ethical. Uh, specific course material and activities, any contributions that you've made to your teaching profession. This could include any recognitions that you've achieved, um, any committees that you've been on, any additional support that you've provided students by being part of um, any uh, committees or um, other organizations that support students. Uh, so those are all really good uh, elements that you want to collect over time and, and start organizing them into a teaching portfolio. We have one more question in the chat. Okay. Yes, Janice, we will, um, we will have access to the recording after. Okay. So some of the, so now to kind of go into detail on some of these elements and um, one area that I wanted to um, kind of break down a little bit is some of this information you may already have versus other documents you may be able to get from, um, from others as well, as far as individuals, as well as organizations. For the materials that you may already have or that you may need to create, um, the, the most common ones are your teaching uh, philosophy and diversity statement. Those are materials that you can create yourself. Um, also, an outline of different teaching responsibilities that you have um, have had over time. This could include uh, course titles, um, numbers and, and types of student enrollment demographics, uh, any courses that you've taught and how they fit in the mission of your uh, Also, um, the other piece here is uh, any components that you can demonstrate your course content, so including your course syllabi, readings, homework, assignments. Those are all great ways to show uh, the information that the material that you have created as, as a teacher. And also an, a, a really important one is um, describing what steps you've taken to improve your teaching. Uh, so the more ref reflection you can take on, you know, what have I done to improve my courses? What activities have I um, developed to ensure and enhance my teaching skills and background knowledge? Um, trying to keep track of that information is, is really helpful. And then also any description of activities um, that have required you to supervise students. And this could include um, being part of um, thesis or dissertation committees or mentorship opportunities, any way that you can show that you have um, supported or supervised students in kind of their own academic journey. journeys is, is all information that you can start um, creating uh, now if you can. The information that you might be able to gather from others um, is mainly evaluation data. So as you teach your classes, um, typically you would conduct an evaluation at some point and you can do it um, in different ways. Um, but most commonly you do have a course evaluation. So collecting any course evaluation data from students um, this could be both present and former students, um, also mentees or assistants that have supported you. Uh, the other evaluations that can be collected is um, if you work with faculty and either do like a team talk class or work really closely with them on developing a specific curriculum, you can get um, request an evaluation from them. Uh, any documentation that shows you've attended um, workshops and conferences such as this uh, workshop today, uh, 
keeping track of that information and documenting it is, is also really helpful. And any uh, honor or recognition awards, um, definitely hold on to those. Um, any type of distinguished teaching award or any sort of recognition that demonstrates um, how you have um, contributed to, um, to teaching is, is, is really great to kind of keep track of. So this is information you can get from others. And then lastly, are uh, products of teaching. So this can include um, mainly it's uh, information from students uh, that you can, um, that shows that you have taught effectively. An important kind of caveat to note here is you wanna ensure that you're following student identity protection regulations and that you're working with the institution to redact any student personal information and de-identify or aggregate their data. But if you can uh, share any samples of student work and the feedback that you have provided and the range of student performance, um, how you've supported it, um, any journals that students have compiled that really reflects their growth and a range of skills, uh, any testimonials that you can get from students um, as far as just kind of how, how your teaching has helped shape them um, in their own journey. Uh, any exam scores that demonstrate student performance and how you have helped them perform. Uh, those are all uh, what they call teaching artifacts or, um, or products of your teaching that really shows how you are effective as an educator. So these are all kind of different elements to keep in mind. And um, it might seem like a lot of information to kind of take in at, at once, especially if you don't have a teaching portfolio. Um, but just, just keep in mind that the, the, the goal for, for, um, for teaching portfolio is to really shape it however, however best suits you at your current time. And it's an evolving process, right? So the goal is to just start. And then as you move along, you will see it um, further uh, grow and, and be refined. And if you are just starting to create a teaching portfolio, some of the recommendations that we have is you know, to start by just starting to collect these components and organize them into a online uh, shared um, uh, drive of some sort. So we uh, we recommend Google Drive or also SharePoint. Um, usually the CGU account uh, will have a SharePoint access that you could use to create um, folders. And then eventually once you have this information collected, uh, we, we also can um, help support you in creating a, a more public facing portfolio through um, a website design such as WordPress um, we have other webinars and other uh, teaching opportunities um, that for, can further develop your ability to create that. So if you're interested in, in doing that, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can help with that as well. But it could start with just as, uh, as easy as starting to organize a, um, a file that kind of starts organizing these different elements. I think we had two questions in the chat, so let's see. So Holly, uh, what is considered appropriate when having a sample of student work is a student asked if their work can be used. That's a really good question. I actually don't have, um, I don't think I have the right answer for that one. Um, Shelby, do you happen to know the answer for that? Um, I think it's good practice to usually ask a student about their work if it can be used in a portfolio like that. Uh, that being said, if you know you can't get the student's consent or whatever, uh, just make sure uh, two things. One, you don't use their name in the sample assignment. And even if they do give their consent, you probably shouldn't use their name. Um, and make sure there's no like really identifying information about the student, like probably not like a personal reflection that um, details information about where they live or uh, stuff like that. But other than that, you're generally good. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Shelby. Yep, and then Jonathan. Yeah, I, I know I, I, I didn't think about testimonials either. I think it's a, another great option as far as um, looking at ways to collect testimonials from students. And Virginia, your question is how to start a portfolio without formal teaching experience. Um, will it look weak? No, it will not. Uh, so the, 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 the quick answer is no, it will not look weak um, because ultimately a teaching portfolio can start with just being a way for you to start organizing your experiences in teaching. Uh, if you don't have formal teaching experience, um, you can uh, develop that as, as you kind of move along and um, you know you can you can create that by starting as with teaching assistance opportunities, also um, with preparing future faculty if, if you have not completed the certificate program, 
you do kind of develop some um, course material that you can show as as um, as a as a way to uh, organize what would look like a course um, and can be a good start. So it would not look weak. Um, it's a it's a starting point that you could then further develop. All right. So any other questions? Great. So we're at about almost 40 minutes. So I think we have a, a good amount of time for just a quick activity. And let me send the link in the chat. Um, and then, oh, actually, Shelby already sent it. Let me send it one more time in case you all need it. And then I'll also share my screen so you can take a look at it. All right. So if you all want to open up that link, and I will also kind of just explain it really quickly. And we'll take about, I would say about five minutes um, to go through this. So let me just reshare my screen. So uh, if anyone has any issues downloading it, please let us know. Uh, but the it should be pretty pretty straightforward to download. I think there is, there should be like three little dots on the side of the document. If you want to download it and save it on your desktop. Um, it is kind of a it's a uh, I don't I don't know if you can edit it. Um, but try not to type in it directly because you you'll see everyone will be typing over their work. So it's only for you to kind of download and access. Um, but what I wanted to do here, um, just kind of to kind of get our, our, our wheels turning a little bit is to think about uh, which elements um, do you currently have that you can start using for your teaching portfolio. So think about some of the elements that you already have. Um, and they might not be complete, they, you might not be fully happy with them yet. But think about what elements you have, think about what elements you still need to create, and then think about what experiences um, you can seek to build on this. Uh, if you haven't finished, feel free to hold on to that document. Um, what's, what's really helpful about this document as well is um, I'm hoping that this uh, document can be used for you to kind of develop some next steps for yourself on how you want to further develop your teaching portfolio. Um, and it's also a great tool to use uh, as you uh, reach out to us and kind of help us uh, or have us help you plan some next steps as far as how you want to shape your teaching portfolio. I wanted to close with some um, quick tips on uh, as you're shaping your teaching portfolio. Um, I'm going to go through these a little fast because I'm looking at the time and I, I don't want to keep you all over. But I did want to share some quick tips on, on how you can um, think about your teaching portfolio and what elements you should keep in mind as you start shaping it. And the first one is to start now. So really think about ways to start collecting information that you currently have. Um, the sooner you can start collecting information, the better. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it's all part of the part process of curation. So the sooner you can start collecting information, the more helpful it will be in the long run. Um, also, really important is to consider your purpose. Uh, what is the purpose of your portfolio? Do you want to use it for job applications? Um, do you want to use it as kind of a an internal kind of process for you to evaluate your teaching approaches? Or do you want to do a combination of both? Um, so think about your purpose for your teaching portfolio. It's also really helpful to think about your audience. Um, what audience uh, do you want to target for your portfolio? Is it a committee? Is it your students? Um, is it a, a more public facing kind of scholarly audience? So who is your audience and, um, and does your portfolio kind of meet their expectations? Another uh, element to consider is, are you using kind of the best modality? Um, do you want to use a, a, a modality that offers more multimedia or more kind of tech support? Or do you want to just keep it really basic and just have it be really user friendly, um, you know, and very low tech? So these are all kind of questions to ask yourself as far as choosing a modality that you want to use for your teaching portfolio. Uh, another really important piece is to ensure that it's centered around your teaching philosophy statement. So your teaching portfolio should really be in alignment to your philosophy statement and should really um, be should really uh, be representative of who you are as an educator. 
So the more closely you could kind of uh, develop your information and even the creative aspects of your teaching portfolio to your teaching philosophy statement, um, the more successful it will be. Another element is uh, organize, organize, organize. You wanna make sure your organization is really explicit to your reader, um, that you have different tables of uh, links. Uh, if you can create a table of contents page, that's really helpful depending on how you wanna use it. It's really helpful to organize your portfolio and organize it um, continuously. Uh, you wanna be selective of what, if, what materials you use. And uh, although a formative portfolio, you can have more kind of a longer collection for a summative portfolio, you definitely want to be selective of that information and ensure that it's filtered um, so that it's targeted to what specifically your audience is looking for. Uh, you want to include annotations, which is really important. Uh, so think back and reflect on, on um, your materials that you've used and annotate them, describe you know, what worked well, what didn't work well, and what changes you would make for the future. Um, it's a really great uh, reflexive process as so you kind of make uh, improve your classes and kind of adapt some of the assessments or assignments that you may use. Um, and you want, want to make sure you're being fair to yourself. So none of us are perfect educators, none of us are perfect people, <laughs> and um, successes and failures are equally important. Um, failures can really help demonstrate resilience and ways that have shaped you as, a, as an educator. So it's um, good to uh, sh show both and really show how you've developed. And lastly is um, to be really systematic about how you organize your information. To me, this one is the toughest, you know, creating a filing system. Um, you can buddy up with somebody and just have kind of times when you uh, reorganize your portfolios and update them. You can also seek consultants who could support you in this, um, especially here at, at, uh, at PFF. We're happy to help, uh, help you kind of take another look at your portfolio and find ways to maybe reorganize it or update your information. And those are the, the key elements that I wanted to highlight. And it's all part of kind of the, what we call a curation process. So you want to make sure that as you curate your portfolio, that it's really aligning to your philosophy. You're looking for trends and patterns, weaknesses, and really summarizing your evaluations. And going back to the magic bag, and unfortunately, I, didn't, I wasn't able to share the clip. But if you all want to take a look at it later, it'll make a little more sense. But think about your own magic bag and, and why it's important to you. And uh, the slides that um, the slides and recording will be emailed to you after our session. I hope you all uh, found it uh, found it helpful. And feel free to reach out to us for further just questions or consultations. We'd be happy to help. Um, you can find us on all kinds of different uh, social media places. Um, thanks to our, our wonderful social media um, partner here that we have, Holly, and, and others here on our team. We have a great. Uh, great support through our social media. And um, here's some additional resources if you all wanna take a look later um, after the session. I also included some digital um, examples. I can stick around and share them with all of you uh, if you would like to stick around a little bit after. But I did wanna leave some time to first kind of have you all share some feedback with us. And then um, after that, we can kind of go back and, and definitely make some time for questions. Yep, so let me, so these are two digital examples and thank you for, I don't, I missed who asked this question, but I'm glad you asked because I was really excited to share these because I thought they were really great um, digital portfolios to look at. Um, the first one I'll share is from Dr. La Luis Javier, forgetting his full last name, let's see if it shows up, Javier Pentone Herrera, and he is a literacy and language educator. Uh, and I really liked his portfolio because it was um, really clean and really easy to, to look at. And it has a lot of really great information in here. So as you can see here, he has his education certificates, publications, and presentations um, as kind of little icons here that you can click on and see. He also has a, um, a blog post that he feeds into. And his About Me um you know describes who he is as an educator um he has kind of a video uh this is actually you know don't be daunted if this seems a, a, like a lot uh i wanted to use them as kind of more aspirational ones that i thought were really nice and he has kind of a publication tab some of the presentations that he's uh it's kind of like a breakdown of some of his components of his cv 
Um, so this one was a, 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 a more kind of a clean, kind of simple teaching portfolio example. And then the other one is, there's a lot going on in this one, but I thought it was really nice. And this is, um, I think his name is Dr. Paul Gordon, I'm forgetting his full last name. Um, but he has, he's definitely been in education for a long time and he is a consultant speaker and um, specializing in residential curriculum and curriculum approaches and student learning and the development of intersection between technology, social media and design. Um, he has a about page that kind of gives a description of all the different ways that he identifies as a scholar, as an author, as an educator. Um, some of the more kind of personal ways that he identifies his bio, his CV. Um, he has a really interesting blog. And then there's information on just different types of workshops and speaking that he does. This one is very advanced, um, but I didn't want to share it all. I'll share it with you all. It's kind of a, you know, you can eventually kind of get to this point as you start organizing your information. Um, so those are the two examples I wanted to share. Um, there's several others. If you, if you just look up, you know, teaching portfolios online, you'll find a lot of examples. Um, the ones that I didn't add, uh, but you can also look at is they, there's a, like a PDF version of a portfolio. So there's a couple samples that you could probably find online. Um, I didn't add them because they, they didn't seem to be public. So I didn't want to share them in this presentation, but there are examples of um, PDF versions of, you know, just kind of a digital uh, kind of binder sort of portfolio that you could also create, um, which you could look, which you could look at if that's what you're trying to develop and if that's what your um, your committee is looking for. But I thought this one was really nice and it's um, definitely uh, lots of information in here that uh, is interesting. All right, any other questions? Kind of lost track of my chat here, so I'm not sure if we have other questions. Um, yeah, Thank you, Liz. You're welcome. Uh, Mitch is asking, can you make it as a uh, teaching portfolio as a Word document? Uh, that's a good question. I You could start as a Word document um, because you can, well, the challenge with creating a Word document is you would like to like have a way to organize it into um, into sub sort of like sub files and um, categories. You can start as a Word document and you can organize kind of your documents based on that. But I do recommend to have kind of an online version of it because it helps you kind of move things around and also create links. So it's a little easier to navigate, but it can definitely start as a Word document. Did that answer your question? So when you say an online version, you mean like creating like folders? Yes. And putting different elements in those? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So if you can, if you, if you use kind of like an online organization platform, such as like a, a Google Doc, you know, which would start as a Word document, um, but creating it into like a cloud-based system where you can create links um, it's, it helps when term, in terms of starting to organize them into different files. If you use it, if you only simply use a Word document, it can get really long and it also becomes really tedious and hard to uh, reorganize as you move along. So it's a lot easier to create, you know, sub files and uh, different subfolders that you want to shift and move around and also link to one another. So that's the value of using um, a more kind of cloud-based system where you can kind of uh, create new links and uh, and also eventually create a table of contents um, that you could organize. Great. So I think that answered your question, right, Mitch? Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. When you, with the formative um, portfolio, when you talk about showing different teaching methods, what what's inclusive in those methods? Do you mean that you're showing digital versus um, in-person 
and or specific, just what, what would fall into that? It, uh, it could really vary depending on what you teach. And um, it, uh, so for a formative teaching portfolio, what's really important is the aspect of reflection and how you've used your assessments to support students in their learning. So the more you're able to, um, you know, for example, it could be uh, an, um, a specific group assignment, right, that you had the students do, um, you completed the course, you know, students did well or did not do well, you reflect back and might write your annotations as far as how it, how it helped and how you may be able to change it later on. Um, that's part of the formative piece of, um, of looking at that document and using it um, in your portfolio. Okay. Did that help you? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, but feel free to ask ask again, or or I I might have have not fully answered it. So if, if there's a diff, another aspect that I'm not covering, feel free to ask me. Well, the, I, I think the part where you talked about, <clears throat> um, you know, showing or or reflecting on what worked or not, mm -hmm. then I think that sort of that that does answer it because you know if you're talking about methods, then you're getting down to the nitty gritty of whatever it was that you did, what worked and what didn't. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely the, the formative piece, right? You want to look at how you can um, update or also just identify which elements have been really successful. So if, if you realize that something that you did in your teaching was really effective, you know, students really kind of got hit the objectives that you were trying to deliver and creating that assessment, you can make some notes and say, you know, this, this way that I did this was really supportive because students were able to um, perform really well according to the rubric that I was using and therefore you know I plan to use it again or it could be you know students really struggled with this and this, these might be some of the reasons why and this is kind of what I would do differently um, next time to either um, redo the assignment or maybe it wasn't as inclusive as I expected it to be uh, so that's the element that is really helpful as far as um, looking back at those at that at your teaching products and um, making notes of how they have been successful and how you could also um, improve them. So then is the uh, formative portfolio um, not public facing? Is that more just for, for you to reflect on? That's a good question. And I don't know if I have the full answer because I wanna say you can probably have a formative um, portfolio that you can share publicly as long as it's um, in a you know a polished enough place where you can where you feel comfortable sharing it. Um, a summative is definitely more um, kind of a complete finished product but then keep in mind that even summative portfolios they're going to eventually become at some some elements of a formative portfolio because you're constantly reshaping them and um, reorganizing them to reflect kind of where you are at now and also just adding new information that you want to uh, share. So it, it's typically that a formative portfolio can be more um, internal, but it could also be that it could be more of a summative portfolio because it's, um, it's complete and you're happy to share it with people and you're also refi refining it as you move along. Yeah, when I was thinking about your examples, I was thinking how it could be useful for say in a job interview or someone was asking where are some of the challenges you um, can think of like related to online teaching or something like that. So mm -hmm. like keeping that formative portfolio, I would guess it would be really helpful for that because you would know, yeah, right away, these are the lessons I learned and this is what I would like to try next time. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I, I don't see there being a problem with having a sharing like a formative portfolio. Um, I'm obviously not the expert. Um, I don't know if, Sh if Shelby maybe has additional comments to share, but I would say a formative portfolio can be um, public facing and can be shared. 
Uh, and as long as you feel that it it has kind of the elements that your committee is seeking and that your or your not committee actually it could be anyone in your audience. Um, as long as it's targeted for your audience and for the purpose that you want to use it for it can be shared publicly. Yeah, I think it depends on um, what your purpose is and it depends on um, how comfortable you are with it, right? So some people use a formative portfolio really for personal reasons, almost to prep for those job interviews and more of a drafting kind of phase. Um, I think if you don't have a summative portfolio yet, um, you know, it, it's a great practice to at least start sharing that a little bit. Um, I don't know if that adds much, but I think you pretty much covered it, Liz. Yeah, uh, one of the things is I would encourage you to come make an appointment with us so we can talk about your particular needs of the portfolio. Um, I think that's one of the things that's uh, super important is to figure out what you want to use it for exactly. Um, and then we can really narrow in on what you should be doing for your particular portfolio. And this is a little bit of a plugged question, but um, so I saw the electronic portfolio examples you were giving, and oh. then I'm and I'm hearing your um, how you're advising to start like with the Google Drive or Google Docs system with the folders, and then thinking about Microsoft Word and other formats. So for someone that is just starting to collect and create their very first teaching portfolio yeah. um like where exactly do you begin and how do you, and how does it progress from like stage one to what we saw for the yeah. e-portfolio examples mm -hmm. that's a good question and i wish we would have had more time to talk about that jonathan because I, I think it's um <clears throat> It's definitely a long process, not well, can't, doesn't have to be a long process, but it's definitely a process to eventually get to, you know, having something that you want to have be very public facing. Um, if you're just starting to create a teaching portfolio, my suggestion would be to, you know, look at that checklist and start there. So look at which elements you have, which elements you still need to create. And like I said, I think that the, the best way to start is just to start organizing your information based on what you have. Um, once you have that, we, um, you know, with the support of PFF and also just kind of your own research, uh, <clears throat> you can start organizing your files um, to a point where you have kind of um, refined them to, uh, to then uh, create a more kind of formal, formative portfolio. Um, maybe not a summative, but where you actually can, would be comfortable sharing it um, with the public audience. And then comes the techie part of kind of creating a website and um, deciding what specifically you want to showcase um, publicly to your um, to your audience. And it could be uh, your audience could be your students. It could be um, other scholars in the field. It could be a committee. Um, if it's a committee, uh, you, you don't technically have to have a website. You could also create like a um, an, uh, a digital portfolio uh, that is um, not um, public to to everyone, but can but they can view um, you know by kind of making your own settings, they can view internally and kind of see how you've showcased your work. You can also uh, create it as a PDF document if you want to um, do hyperlinks to all the different files in your um, in your portfolio and then and then add just specific attachments that you want to share with them. So you could, you know, show an example of your course syllabi, share an example of, you know, inclusive ways that you teach, um, share your TPS and your DVS statement and create kind of like a, a PDF version of a portfolio. That might also be acceptable depending on who you want to use it for. But it all starts with, you know, the first piece is definitely collecting, then organizing, reorganizing it, finding a filing process that works best for you and kind of what you want to use it for. And then eventually, if you decide you want to um, to make it a, a more interactive and public facing um, uh, tool, then you could, you have all the information already to then kind of start plugging into 
your specific pages that you want to use um, on your website or, or a different process that you want to use it for. So if I didn't want to make a website, all those folders I set up, huh? I could make a PDF that links to the folders on yep. my Google or OneDrive. Huh? But if I did want to make a website, those folders would just probably become pages on a website. Exactly. That, um, potentially. Well, it depends on how you lay out your website pages, but it, it, uh, the content that you include in your website could become parts of your portfolio. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think we're a little, well, actually not a little, we're 15 minutes over time. Um, thank you all for sticking around. Does anybody have any other questions before we close? And thank you again very much for attending and I hope it was helpful. Um, feel free, like I said in, in the, um, we will share these slides out um, and it will have additional information as far as how to contact us. Uh, if you have any questions or need further support or just want to continue the discussion, feel free to make an appointment with us and we'd be happy to kind of take it from, from here where we're at and um, hold on to that worksheet as well. Uh, I think it'll be a good kind of starting point. If you are just getting started, it'll give you some kind of first steps on how to chart your teaching portfolio. And with that, I would like to close our session. Um, oh, and thank you, Shelby, for sharing the link. If you all